Well, I'd like to start this afternoon with one of Herbert McCabe's papers that I don't think receives enough attention. McCabe's talk on obedience to the Dominican sisters at Rosary Priory in Bushney, which is subsequently published in New Blackfriars. Now, this may strike you as an unusual place to talk to begin a paper build on McCabe's realism. Because though the topic is obedience, the paper shows McCabe as the consummate teacher, and I will argue both that it touches on major themes in McCabe works, McCabe's work and suggests a wider, what I'm going to call a developmental realism in McCabe as opposed to a sort of fixed ontology. Since McCabe is accused by some commentators, most notably Francesca Murphy, of using method to move away from a realistic ontology of God, it seems fitting to start with one of the methods of religious life as a concrete and actionable way to God that one develops one's ontology of God, if you will, that refuses to fix on this side of the eschaton. McCabe is sensitive to the way in which the method or structures of obedience could become a limitation to one's engagement with God and reality, but when properly understood and lived, this becomes a means for developing in the love of God and community. Now, the McCabe's talk to the sisters begins by addressing prima facie, the prima facie conflict between religious obedience and freedom. That is the conflict between the subjects and the superior's will. The simple picture of obedience is strictly hierarchical. The superior gives commands to the subject in such a way that the subject might execute those commands. Hopefully the superior is correct in her commands and that the good subject comprehends enough to understand what must be done and bends to this higher authority. Further, these commands are only necessary because of the fallenness of the world and resulting in the inevitable conflict of wills that will result. Now, McCabe wants to resist or at least fill out this picture. McCabe rejects that obedience is the triumph of the superior's will over the subject's will. Underlying this op opposition is a modern understanding of the self as opposed to a communal understanding of the self, where obedience is a form of the subjugation of one will to another. Specifically, he rejects the assumption that either will is fully formed unto itself and has some special integrity uh, in this splendid isolation or some special uh, autonomy. Thus, obedience, thus, in obedience, one will does not necessarily deform another. McCabe writes, quote, This idea of the individual which forms the very basis of our society, the society we are prepared to defend with nuclear missiles, a bit of a provocateur, is, is completely mythical. There are no such animals. And he would hold that neither St. Dominic nor St. Thomas Aquinas would recognize their own understandings of human willing nor obedience in an adversarial picture of individuals set against one another. Obedience presumes human beings as essentially social animals, able to identify, negotiate, and share goods in common. The cave contrasts what he takes to be the modern assumptions around obedience with the Dominican tradition expressed in Thomas. Thomas writes, Imperium, the act of commanding or ordering, is not an act of will, but of intelligence, though of course it presupposes will. It is the act of one who understands what is to be done, end quote. And he reminds the sisters, quote, you must have heard a thousand times, obedere comes from ob audere, to listen. End quote. The obedient, this obedience involves sharing the language of another such that she can be heard and understood. True obedience, or obedience in its full sense, is found not in complying with the will of the other. Mere compulsion truncates the superior and the subject because the act of communication is limited to the understanding of bare compliance. The superior orders the subject to do X, and the subject grudgingly accepts not knowing why. Though sometimes obedience functions in this way, this is a defective form of obedience. It reduces the relationship between superior and subject, subject to something mechanical rather than something human, much less something aiming towards the divine. No one could say that my dog or my computer is obedient to me insofar as they follow my lead. This is not the sort of obedience McCabe is interested in. Such obedience conceives the subject as an extension of the superior. 
For McCabe and Thomas, reason is public and expressed in language. And this is, a central, this is central to McCabe's thought. Obedience is a sharing a certain public reason for the good of the community. McCabe writes, obedience only becomes perfect when the one who commands and the one who obeys share one mind, end quote. Obedience is judged by the depth of listening and understanding more than by the deference of will. McCabe understands obedience as a means by which both superior and subject come to a mutual understanding and coordination of a shared good of the community. For McCabe, the dynamic between superior and subject is broadly the dynamic between, the dynamic between student and teacher. When education functions properly, the student shares in the mind of the teacher. This happens over the course of years. The child in the classroom cannot understand as the teacher does, and for her own education must obey through deference on the way to obeying through understanding. So to the novice in a community. For a teacher, simply to impose answers on the student is to retain an epistemic and balance indefinitely. It is to defeat the purpose of teaching. So to McCabe writes, quote, the job of the superior is not to make her or his will prevail. It is to play the central role in an educational process by which the good for the house becomes clear to everyone, including her. Our motto, remember, is veritas, truth, helpfully written on the chair. The process or method of community governance of masters, provincials, and priors is to understand the truth of the community and its mission, which, is all, which must ultimately mean learning about the world and the place of the community in the world. Above all, the community is formed to seek after God and God's call to the community, so that one can be obedient to Christ in the community and share Christ's obedience to the Father. The faith that enlivens the community is communal. It is shared understanding. Community itself, with its various structures, its methods, is a way to God. And McCabe concludes, quote, So learning to live in community, learning genuine obedience, is the exploration of God. End quote. The developing understanding of the community is an exploration of God. The community explores divine life through the practices of their human lives together, forged and taught by obedience. This is a communal and developmental re realism of the experience of God that ongoingly forms the language for exploring God. Though community may come to, be, to a shared understanding with their human superiors over time, obedience to Christ is never properly understood. McCabe writes, Now because our obedience, our solidarity in community, is no mere human thing, but a sharing in into this mystery, it is also true that both, both that the community is greater than I and that I and the community are one, the dynamism of obedience, the common life of the community, is the dynamism of the Trinity." End quote. The process of coming to understand Christ and Christ's call in the community is necessarily incomplete short of the eschaton. And this is another key in McCabe's thought. A robust engagement of human beings in the reality of God precisely through, not despite, acknowledging and reverencing the mystery of God. Community, and more broadly humanity, is immersed in the great task of obedience to Christ, a task which remains a mystery. This is a difficult task that demands human sacrifice and ongoing striving for the will of God in the community. As McCabe writes, it takes a lot more trouble of ev for everybody and needs a lot more patience from everybody to create a community which comes to a common mind than simply to set up a chain of command and persuade people to do as they are told because that makes life easier for them. It is a lot more trouble to make a real obedience possible. And this is the eternal life of the Holy Spirit." End quote. The striving for shared understanding does not make the Holy Spirit understandable, but it is an immersive and demanding response to the Spirit. Now, if McCabe's Dominican community is anything like my Jesuit community, 
community discussions range from the profound to the ridiculous, from great ideas to terrible ones. And true obedience is found in seeking the spirit across a wide spectrum along with the rest of the community. And this is a difficult task. Communities form individuals over time to the ongoing and indeed eschatological, eschatological task of real obedience. And though noting the difficulties, McCabe has a particularly optimistic view of the power of communities to share in this same reason that transcends itself. Now in the talk that he gives to the sisters, McCabe briefly recounts his own formation and community. He writes that, quote, the process of growing up and developing the personality I have was brought of being, was a process of being brought into having a role in a whole succession of communities, end quote. The formation of various communities brought McCabe to the role of teacher for most of his life, a teacher who formed students, including many Dominican <laughs> students, into an obedient, truth-seeking community. One understood properly the role of teacher and the role of superior converge. The teacher helps to form people in a common understanding, a common language. A teacher of theology forms a common understanding of Christ Again, like a, like a superior, though in a different mode. Obedience to Christ, a find, finding ways of speaking about Christ within community, was deeply informed by, but extended beyond the, the confines of his Dominican community to various other communities. The cave took his teacher's sensibility to his role as editor of New Black Blackfriars and in the first issue as editor, he described the journal's task as cultivating relationships, retaining old friendships, building new friendships, end quote, as a contribution to a living debate that concerns us all, end quote. The journal itself formed a kind of community, or at least sought to support kinds of community. At the beginning of his most famous book, God Matters, McCabe sets out his project for this book and his much wider writings as an exercise in teaching what matters and avoiding what leads one astray. In his very first sentence of the preface, he notes that the genesis of his writing air lectures and preaching to community principally. In this and other collections, much of what we have are these lectures and sermons uh, delivered to various, in various places, including to various residents of this community and other communities that would gather here. In the preface, he goes on, what matters according to McCabe, quote, that only God, that the only God, mat, that the only God who matters is the unfathomable mystery of love because of which there is being and meaning to anything else that is. And that we are united with God in matter, in our flesh, and in his flesh, end quote. Surely any superior would desire a similar understanding of unfathomable mystery for those under obedience. Now for, being, for McKay being united to God in Dominican community in his case, or in other communities in which we find ourselves, is more widely in the church being formed in a community, con in community concretely matters because God matters. In the text, McCabe suggests two targets, two ways of thinking that run counter to what matters, run counter to the love of the unfathomable mystery of God who matters. The first that run counter to it is, quote, that we can speculate about the sort of being God is and how he ought to behave. And the second, that our link with God is especially non-bodily or mental affair. McCabe takes himself to be following his teacher and confer Thomas Aquinas in both what matters and what, run, what runs counter to what matters. These are not targets of clarification of metaphysical nor linguistic nicety, but counter confusions that also matter because they, disfer, they disturb a formation in, mystery, in the mystery of love that matters above all else. Central to McCabe's project is, avoid, is to avoid saying ridiculous things about what matters. McCabe's resistance to speculation about the sort of being God is raises more than a little suspicion. After all, he is a teacher in an order that strives to hand down the fruits of its contemplation to others. Refusing to speculate seems to truncate what can be handed down 
to add, methodolo to add a methodological millstone to the necks of the, fri necks of the friars as they go out to preach. Herein lies the concern. Would Miss Cave stop those who would speak about God from saying something important or true? Does this caution of speaking about God, particularly about the sort of being God is, truncate or distort religious speech? Various critics raise such concerns explicitly or implicitly against McCabe. Namely, that McCabe is undermining what matters by setting a roadblock because his approach to what matters is in thrall to method that undermines what matters. While Thomas himself cautions against positive predication of God, McCabe is accused of going far beyond Thomas. And I will focus and particularly on Francesca Murphy's critique of this, which is the most extensive critique making these sorts of claims. Murphy devotes a considerable portion of her uh, book, God is Not a Story, Realism Revisited, to critiquing McCabe. Though McCabe has other critics, for example, Christopher Insull in his The Realistic Hope, Murphy, to her credit, engages with McCabe's text in an extended fashion, which is not the case with many other critics of McCabe who are more light in their dismissal. Though Murphy only draws from two of the collections of McCabe, God Matters and God Still Matters. Now Murphy groups McCabe with David Burrell, Dennis Turner, with David Burrell and Dennis Turner, in which she calls grammatical Thomas. And Murphy takes these grammatical Thomas along with the story Thomas Robert Jensen and the story Barthians, George Lindbeck and Hans Frey as offering movie-like narratives that deracinate theology from reality by devotion to method. Now, of course, realism and anti-realism are comparative terms. One can be realist about certain entities and not others. And as various authors have noted, Thomas Aquinas himself is an anti-realist by some Platonic standards, as many Franciscan uh, thinkers around his time and the Bishop of Paris were eager to point out. Yet Thomas has been recruited as a partisan for a kind of pro-realism argument in the 19th century. Now, certainly he was a realist about the existence of God in the world. Murphy seems to take up a kind of 19th century reading of Thomas against, as against a certain partisan anti-realism, though it may not be the, a position that Thomas would have contemplated himself. And this is the position she's offering against McCabe. Murphy offers a complicated and interweaving history of grammatical Thomism, though it is difficult to precisely disambiguate her critique of McCabe from the other grammatical Thomist. The term grammatical Thomist being retrospectively applied to McCabe, Burrell, and various other thinkers. McCabe would cer certainly be no doubt be surprised to learn that he was a grammatical Thomist, especially as one who self-consciously avoided consigning himself to a particular school of thought. Now, McCabe holds that, or Murphy rather holds that, grammatical Thomism is a way of thinking about Thomas Aquinas in which method becomes the very content of the grammatical Thomist theology. Murphy's obje objection is not that method is such, even Thomas can ha be said to have a method of sorts, but to what she takes to be the primacy of method over a realistic metaphysics. One can apply a method to an underlying reality. Murphy's objection is that method cannot dictate the scope of reality or catch one the method can dictate the scope of reality or catch one in a trap of merely talking about talking. Thus, one may be right to observe that Thomas is concerned with the grammar of predicates of God, but wrong to let grammar rules determine what one might say about God, at least in Murphy's view. The grammatical Thomist extracts a few methodological concerns from the angelic doctor and gives them primacy, excluding Thomas's wider thought in the process. Method, thus ascendant, collapses the realism of the theological speech within methodological bounds. Murphy writes, narrative theologies offer a pre-verbal machination of reality, providing the materials for an abstraction of essence not for the concretization of an image, since such cognitive acts do not set the perceiver free to love as another, narrative theologies substitute a method for the personal love of God. The technology of method in Murphy's telling 
blocks the way to God, a very serious charge against a theologian. Etienne Gilson looms large in Murphy's telling of what, con what constitutes a proper Thomas. And Gilson is cited throughout God is not a sorry uh, against the grammatical Thomists. She makes her admiration for Gilson even more clear in a recent uh, pub um, publication in the Catholic Handbook of Theology, Thomism, 1870 to 1962, where she talks about Gilson's vision of the great Thomist family. And Gilson defines membership in this family as, as, quote, who does not like to believe what he can know and who never pretends to know what he can believe, and yet a man whose faith and knowledge grow in organic unity because they spring from the same divine source, end quote. Though maintaining the distinction between natural reason and revelation, this Thomist family, a Thomist family she sees McCabe excluded from, points to something of a seamless connection between, between faith and between revelation and natural reason in, the, in their underlying reality. The organic unity of faith and reason is precisely what the primacy of method is meant to disrupt. In the case of natural reason and revelation, because they are two different modes of speaking about God, method treats them differently, thus, un thus disturbing an underlying realism. Method analyzing our ways of knowing God blocks the way to God, Murphy writes, these questions, such as how we speak about God, reflect methodological concerns. The principle, God is a story, is set to work the moment one equates one's method of knowing God, such as scripture, with God as such. End quote. As such, God as such must be prior to the mode of knowing God. Murphy goes on invoking Gilson, whoever sticks a finger into the machinery of Cartesian method must expect to be dragged along its whole course. The Cartesian element in all narrative theologies is that their method is their starting point, end quote. The accusation is that McCabe, along with other grammatical Thomists, are committed to method that, like Descartes' method, cuts them off from reality. For, McCabe, for Murphy, McCabe's first target, that we can speak about the sort of thing God is and how he should behave, while properly recognizing the limits of our knowledge of God in its origin in Thomas, becomes a methodological blinder in McCabe's hands. Murphy frequently invokes a cinematic metaphor to illustrate the constraints of method. Quote, the most of what of which such a cinematic belief in God can deliver to Christian theology is an account of thought, feeling, and imagination of belief that function within it, truncating everything else off, end quote. Method moves theology from a three-dimensional interactive world of reality to a carefully curated but flat world of the screen. Within method, one can present a story, but one that is constrained to the limits of philosophical technology ill-suited to the reality it is meant to portray. Now, McCabe certainly does not take himself to be truncating the exper experience nor and understanding of God through method but using certain methods that allow growth in relationship with God. Method is like obedience in community. When used properly, it is an aid to growth. Murphy is correct that McCabe goes beyond Aquinas in his use of logic and linguistic tools. McCabe's friend, Anthony Kenny, notes in the foreword to Herbert McCabe's On Aquinas, based on a lecture series delivered here, that while McCabe was allergic to being defined by any school, he was a keen student of both Thomas and Wittgenstein. McCabe's reading of Thomas is, quote, as he admits, in a sense more linguistic than the historical Aquinas was, end quote. For McCabe, analytic tools available to 20th and presumably 20th century, 21st century thinkers are superior to their 13th century counterparts, especially with regard to linguistic analysis. These tools allow for friendly amendments to Thomas. What, fig what figures following Frege and Wittgenstein have in common, and what McCabe says of himself is that they start from language and end, they start from the language end of, as Aquinas does, starting from the thought end. 
McCabe goes on to clarify, we analyze understanding and thinking in terms of communication, whereas Aquinas analyzes communication in terms of understanding and thinking, end quote. Underlying this point of disagreement is a more fundamental point of agreement for Thomas, Wittgenstein, and McCabe, that rational animals are beings that are also necessarily linguistic animals. McCabe views his friendly disagreement with Thomas as a way of, of proving Thomas more fundamentally right. Now, the move from thought to language is the slip to method for Murphy. Murphy finds the constraints of method everywhere she looks in McCabe's writing. Her main evidence of the ruin of method on McCabe is in his distinction between creator and creature, especially in his reading of the five ways and in the real distinction, which are both evacuated of meaning by method. Though proofs for the existence of God and the real distinction are metaphysical in the hands of Thomas, Murphy objects that the grammatical Thomas reduce these to questions of language and prioritize a narrative produced by linguistic methods. The five ways are reduced to a series of why or how come questions. Murphy writes that for the grammatical Thomas, quote, the highest form taken by human questioning rationality is language, and since the why proof finds its vocation in providing an argument which prescends from empirical events, it functions perfectly within a theory aimed at translating metaphysical concerns into the concerns of the log into concerns about the logic of religious language, end quote. Murphy holds, um, Murphy holds what she takes to be the contrary, that the five ways are about empirical events, which, quote, wend through causes, movements, and poten potentialities, actualities, and guided growth. She goes on, Thomas was one of those literal-minded fellows with whom it is torture to watch television. In their naive realist delight in the facts before their eyes, such persons lose the drift of the most basic editorial cuts. As such, such as from day to night, into it no implied sense in the gaps, and loudly required and loudly required to be led across each scene shift, end quote. Now what empirical evidence Murphy might have as to Thomas Aquinas' televouching television watching habits, I could not possibly say, but we'll move on. Murphy appeals to the authority of Gilson to soften McCabe's methodological distinctions. She quotes, she says, Etienne Gilson was more cautious than McCabe, for every philosopher who is also a Christian believes that the world is created by God, and thus believes in a difference between created nature and divine nature but few medieval Christian theologians thought much of the real distinction, end quote. The real distinction seems to be a side feature of Christian thought about creation that McCabe makes the main event. Again, Murphy quotes Gilson that just because created beings do not provide sufficient reason for their own existence, quote, does not necessarily imply that the thing in question is itself composed of its own essence and of its own existence. It merely expresses the relation of effect to cause, which obtains between any creature and its creator. End quote. Murphy takes the grammatical argument for the real distinction and why questions to require a certain type of intuition. She writes that the distinction between essay and exist and essence takes on its impact when we see as when we see it as running through human being, because the why question is essentially experiential or phenomenological. Like the five ways, Murphy argues that one cannot immediately move to the vertical why does not, Murphy argues that one cannot immediately move to the vertical why does not exist only to horizontal, only quote, horizontal arguments move from movement and cause, all based not in essay, but in nature or quiddity, end quote. Murphy argues that grammatical Thomas metalinguistic readings of the five ways, quote, inadvertently full first circle into the foundational, into a foundationalist fideism of faith, end quote. She reasons that because essay is evacuated of meaning in this world, and thus of any vital concern of human be and thus of any vital concern human beings might have. Again, drawing on Jill San, Murphy returns to her vision of to the vision of organic unity 
quote, the existence of God, which can both lead non-believers to this insight and which enables believers to corroborate their faith with evidence, end quote. But nothing in McCabe's account precludes this corroboration in the development of insights, though he would suspect any final settlements, and I think that's a key distinction. McCabe's clear distinction between divine and human is meant to allow for richly drawn creaturely life that is intimately involved with divine life. In his reading of the five ways as why questions, he clearly distinguishes between the sorts of answers the five ways are seeking after the, and answers within the created realm. McCabe insists that God is not part of the universe, but is creator of the universe. Therefore, McCabe includes every action in the world is an action of God, end quote. It is compatible with the action being an act, and this is compatible with the action also being the action of a creature. So too that anything that is God, that is, is because God is, but this does not subsume the individual substance into God. It is from these distinctions that McCabe's first target against claiming to speculate about the sort of being God, about the sort of being God is, arises. God is the sort of being who is wholly unlike created beings. Murphy's suspicion seems to be that the clarity of these distinctions is a product of method rather than reality. To use her television metaphor, that this clear distinction is a jump cut in the service of some imposed narrative. Now, what is puzzling about Murphy's critique is the narrow construal of language such that McCabe's pivot to language is a pivot away from reality. Certainly, Wittgenstein, who, mo who motivates at least part of McCabe's move to language, speaking about grammar does not preclude speaking about the essence of things. As Wittgenstein famously claims in the Philosophical Investigations, essence is expressed in grammar. The distinction between speaking in a grammar and undertaking a gra grammatical investigation is central to a realism of Wittgenstein's approach. Grammar itself is a body of rules for making true and false statements. The rules of grammar specify what falls under various concepts and how concepts combine to form sensible propositions. The rules of grammar are, of course, not themselves candidates for truth or falsity. The methods of grammar are meant to clarify the essence of things, not to dictate the sorts of things that can be spoken about. Grammar tells us what kind of thing an object is, as Wittgenstein says. If theology is to have a methodological privilege, it is only insofar as it brings to light what is already happening in language. Philosophy aims at an overview of our use of words, that they may be surveyable. A survey is not a methodological constraint in Murphy's sense. Anthony Kenny has made the case on various occasions that a Wittgensteinian approach to philosophy harkens back to the pre-Cartesian approach, albeit with sensitivity to the developments in logic. As Kenny notes, quote, Wittgenstein, like Aquinas, stands at the opposite pole of philosophy from the Cartesian tradition, which sees epistemology as the basic philosophical dis discipline and private conscience as the fundamental datum of epistemology, end quote. Wittgenstein's grammar is an escape from the primacy of a certain kind of method rather than the manifestation of it. McCabe hints at this rather col colorfully, noting that the dark ages of the Renaissance, uh, when scholastic logic was lost, only came to an end with Frege and the logical illumination that continues with Wittgenstein. Herbert McCabe pithily summarizes Thomas and his approach to Thomas as engaged with reality. The context of human living and a fortiori human teaching is created and ordered by God. This human context where humans live and move is close yet mysterious. Quoting McCabe, Aquinas thought that the point of human living cannot lie outside human living. I mean, it cannot lie outside, the, outside in the way that the point of a machine lies outside itself. I think it is true and very, very important, importantly true, that the point of human living lies beyond itself, but not outside itself. Quote. The God is profoundly present, and you human beings retain their integrity as creatures. Now, McCabe finds common cause between Wittgenstein's mystical in the Tractatus and Thomas's essay. The question of essay is not about how the world or anything in it exists, but that it exists. 
And in his article on the logic of mysticism, McCabe writes, for St. Thomas then, essay, the essay of things turns out to be their createdness, their gratuity, so that all talk of God has its foundation in the essay of creatures, end quote. But McCabe's use of essay does not reduce God to a quirk of grammar. He continues, this is not a reductionist view of God, though we are saying that all talk of God, that we are saying all talk of God is really about features of the world. Distinct, end quote, distinguishing essay is precisely to avoid reducing God to features of the world while still acknowledging God acting through all the features of the world. Apart from reducing God to a story, this approach sees God as active in every story and in all of creation. Now, McCabe is not strictly bound to Wittgenstein or his methods. Well, the mystical is the end of speech for Wittgenstein, at least on McCabe's reading. Quote, St. Thomas does not give up so easily, end quote. Knowing what God is not is the basis for speaking of God, while acknowledging that we, that we are saying what God is not through analogy and elaborating through metaphor. Careful predication is not quietism. One deeply invested like community in community like McCabe is an odd candidate for Cartesianism. Far from being in the thrall of a Cartesian method, McCabe argues that, quote, my thought can never be just mine as my sensations are mine. There could scarcely be a greater contrast with the world of René Descartes, end quote. For Thomas N. McCabe, quote, my thinking is my capacity to transcend my individuality. It is my thinking of meanings which are not mine, end quote. This is also true of my obe of obedience to a superior. One enters into the public thought of the community. Following Thomas, McCabe draws a connection between immateriality and intelligence. Human intelligence may be rooted in the material and shared, it may be rooted in the material and shared in community. Divine intelligence is wholly immaterial. Human beings have no access to understand such intelligence except by their own limited intelligence. McCabe writes, because intelligence belongs to the immaterial, if we deny materiality to God, we must say he is intelligent. Because, a piece, because of a piece of negative knowledge, we can make this positive statement. End quote. Harkening back to what matters to McCabe, it matters that human beings try to speak about God in this way. But it also matters that they are self-conscious about the limits of their speaking about God. It matters that when we try to speak about God, we are self-conscious about how we are doing so. McCabe writes, we are simply taking, the, taking language from the family context in which we understand it, and using it to point beyond what we understand into mystery that surrounds and, sus the su and sustains the world, we do partly understand, end quote. But this self-consciousness is not a dead end, but is an impulse to move forward. Indeed, McCabe reads the five ways, for example, as an investigation into the language of God and by extension in the sorts of practices one undertakes to talk about God. McCabe observes that, to, quote, to assert that God exists is to claim the right and the need to carry on an activity, to be engaged in research, end quote. And this research includes language and the community of speakers of that language. Faith and reason find their organic unity in the activities of seeking after God. Faith is a sharing in God's knowledge, which is still a kind of darkness but it is natural to God, but not because it is natural to God and not to human beings. In his discussion of faith, McCabe returns to an educational image to explain faith. In the human realm, one grows up, one grows from needing to accept the authority of teachers to eventually and perhaps only in certain areas knowing for oneself. The student may refuse the authority of the teacher when she comes to develop critical thinking on her own, but would be foolish to do so otherwise. So too is divine life increases when so too divine life increases when one is on earth, but never to the point of, of a critical thought on divine life. As McCabe says, we never dispense with faith until we actually see God face to face. Faith is distinguished from knowledge in the necessity of the trust required. Quote, now faith is certainly a leap into the unknown, in a sense that what you believe is something that cannot be known by ordinary human power. But it is a leap precisely, but 
It is a leap which precisely tries to make this known. It is not a rejection of knowledge. It is an effort to know more, to get to know more by trusting in, the, in a teacher. This trust in the divine teacher, like a trust in a human teacher, develops the student and manifests itself concretely. As McCabe go, notes, the divine life, therefore, the divine life, therefore, because it transcends human life, will involve some reorganization of human life towards a larger world, the world of eternity. Though the precise, though it is the, the precise determination of this can't be set out ahead of time. The reorganization of, human, of the human through encounter with the divine is enabled by the non-competition of humanity and divinity, which is expressed in the real distinction. McCabe writes, I would claim that our divinity, one manifestation of which is faith, transcends our humanity, but is certainly not opposed to it. The spirit of Christ by which we live is not destructive, but creative. It does not reject anything human, end quote. Rather, the spirit allows for new ways of being, acting, and exploring. Though McCabe does use the image of movie projection to describe the incarnation, so, McCabe, so Murphy does have that right, the force of this image is the receptivity of a screen, the ability of the screen not to distort the projection of the divine because of, and I quote McCabe here, the rubbish dump that is the world at times, <laughs> end quote. In Wittgensteinian tone, McCabe's likens human life to a game more than a movie. He writes, we are born players of this game. We do not decide what shall be its aim and purpose. We discover these things. And the best, end quote, the best way to learn the rules of the game is to play it with the help from experienced players. And McCabe notes that even the Decalogue is an outline of rules and precisely how to follow these is not always clear. Jesus Christ is the only human being who plays the game perfectly. The saints play it well. And divine charity is the rule that regulates all the other rules. McCabe takes theological speech principally to be concerned with, with avoiding saying things that stifle formation so that we can keep playing and learning the game. In describing theology, he writes, theology is a difficult and very rewarding occupation, but for the most part, it is not concerned with trying to say what God is, but trying to stop us talking nonsense, trying to stop people making God in their own images, to stop us from making mistake, from mistaking our concepts and images and words for the mystery towards which they point, end quote. The theological task is primarily negative to avoid saying silly, perhaps even idolatrous things about God. The methods one uses to evaluate the expressions of faith are ultimately at the service of living faith, playing the game in community. McCabe writes, faith can be and has to be expressed in propositions, but it isn't about these propositions. The propositions themselves have continually to be tested to make sure they are expressions of faith and not of something else, expressions that is of belief in God's love for us. The listening exercise, end quote, the listening exercise of obedience is one manifestation of this testing. Philosophical and religious language, reflection on philosophical and theological language is another. Improperly claiming to know the essence of God is to speculate on a topic on which we cannot speculate and stifles the process of coming to know and live what truly matters. And for McCabe, growing in God's love matters above all else. Thank you.